Our theme this year is inspiration. Can you share an example of how a teacher, a coach, or another caring adult has inspired you, and what have you taken from this to encourage you in your efforts to carry that legacy to the present and to the future to inspire those that are that touch that you touch in your personal and professional life? Go ahead, Phil. Uh, I'll, I'll step out with one. I, uh, my, uh, the person I would relate here was neither a coach, a teacher, or a mentor, but he was uh, my mentor who went before me through Vietnam and did three tours in Vietnam. And what he taught me, which I try to share now, is that we need to be patient in special ways with military children. His children lived in, uh, on four different continents, mine three, and uh, he was deployed three long tours in Vietnam, including two then longer tours in Korea, separate from that, apart from his family. And uh, for people like me who grew up in one small town and went to primary, middle, and senior school on the same block, it was hard for me to cope with what was going on with my children who went to school on three different continents and across four different states in America. And what he taught me was that they will have a different path and they will understand and relate to children differently. And quite frankly, watching my children now, two having graduated from college and one about to graduate from high school, they will have special and amazing experiences that other children do not. So I think learning to understand and now passing on to young airmen families that your children are going to have a very different experience and be patient with them is probably one of the most things, the most important things I've learned. Yeah, I mean, at the risk of <clears throat> alienating my British colleague here, I'll tell you that my Irish grandmother, <laughs> um, and this is not, yeah, this is why, that's right, we got the Navy separate, se two men separated by a common language. <laughs> um, but, you know, you often, I mean, look, you get to be us, there's a lot of luck involved. I can absolutely assure you that in my case. But, but I think also somewhere along the line, somebody probably told you, and maybe it was reinforced at different times, that you could be special. You know what I mean? And uh, that started with me with my Irish grandmother immigrant who, as the firstborn grandchild, was bound and determined to do two things. One was she was going to make darn sure that I knew I was Irish. And, uh, absolutely indoctrinated me with, you know, you, you, I've actually tortured you with it, Beth, but with, you know, every Irish song ever written, I think, is in my head. It's like a jukebox, you know. <laughs> or I suppose I should say iTunes these days. <laughs> but the other thing she did is, you know, she just kind of kept hammering away. You know, you can be special. You can be special. And then I remember at one point in high school, a, a particular teacher that Deanie and I, uh, Deanie and I are high school sweethearts, had the same teacher, and it was that it was that reinforcement that you can be special. And I think that you know to highlight what Phil said, I think emphasizing for our children that their experiences actually allow them to be they are different. You know, they they come from that one percent club in America, but it, they also can be very special. Absolutely. I think is something this organization actually helps us do. Absolutely. Can I say something about my Irish grandmother? Oh. <laughs> ah! Let's switch seats. <laughs> <laughs> um, what my Irish grandmother taught me was ruthless stubbornness and a determination and a delight in bucking authority. Uh, and actually that, if I can just turn it round a bit uh, also, um, and talk about my half Irish wife as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they say the better half. <laughs> the better half. <laughs> um, who's, who's, who comes from a long line of, of Ulstermen and women. And if uh, the one characteristic about people from Ulster as well is, is stubbornness and determination. Uh, and we have seen this in spade loads in the way, and I'll move on to the, the other bit of inspiration here, is the way that uh, this particular lady who's sitting in the front row here, and I'm going to be killed for this in a minute, 
but I'm going to say it anyway, has worked tirelessly to support our wounded soldiers at a time when uh, things were not right four years ago was not a good story in the way we looked after our people. I think we can say proudly that we, they're getting not only the very best, best clinical support, but also the best holistic support in the military bubble which our wounded warriors deserve. But also our people, our families, our children as well. And I've seen her uh, marching, supervising march-ins for multinational families when we moved our headquarters across from Germany to UK last year. I just highlight one other inspirational per uh, person, if I may, which, which in a sense sort of, she, 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 she epitomizes the resilience and the strength of so many ordinary people who have been faced with the most extraordinary and challenging circumstances which you will all recognize. Her son, this woman is called, uh, this lady is Diane Durney. Her son, Ben, a young, strapping, six foot three, uh, airborne artilleryman, desperately wounded in Afghanistan in 2006, and I think probably on record, the most seriously wounded uh, of our soldiers to have survived. Diane gave up everything. She has worked tirelessly, not only for him, but for other wounded soldiers as well. Not only for the soldiers, but for their families and for their children. And this is a woman who, has, who was living a very ordinary life, but just exemplifies that spirit of ordinary people doing extraordinary things, which I think underpins so much of what UMSEC are about. It's uh, pretty obvious that everybody in this room is, is a product of, of parents and siblings and grandparents and where we came from. But quite frankly, I think the profession of arms that we all um, participate in is, is a profession that we as a nation, <clears throat> excuse me, have got to emphasize to our young people. We've got to be role models. We've got to have opportunities uh, to share the fact that to live in a great republic, we have to have shared sacrifice. And so for my upbringing and uh, from you know, Depression era parents and World War II uncles and aunts, uh, we have to be able to pass that on. And this organization is, is out there in the schools working with young people. And I, and I commend you all for doing that. Thanks. I guess, you know, two things strike me. Uh, one, I had a, when I was in high school, uh, I played football. And I was a receiver, and so uh, the person that the quarterback throws the ball to. And it was in a practice, and, and, and the, the given play that was being called, basically, you know, it was a, you divert, you divert most people one way, and then the quarterback throws the ball to me on the other side. So that's the play. We call it in practice. And I actually, I, you know, you kind of running, and I slipped and fell. And it was, it was, the coach came to me and he said, Tony, when we call your play, you can't fall. <laughs> it, was just, it was like, you don't understand. We're calling your play, you can't fall. And, and it struck me, because obviously it was a critique, but the, the lesson it was is like, you need to be purposeful, right? And, and every day is a play, and so, do you just go through the motions of, well, here's what I'm going to do? Or are you really purposeful, focused on, this is my play and how am I going to get the most out of it? And so that was a, a personal inspiration to me to say, live my life in a more purposeful way so that I'm making sure that I am following through and I'm not just going through the motions. And if I couple that with, frankly, what brought me to this role, which was, I candidly had spent most of my life, if not frankly, all my life in, in a private sector. Right? And, and so I had done work in education, education reform, but in the private sector. But what, what I found and what was true for me is education has really been a differentiator. And you see it in the statistics. To the degree that you have, a, if you're a high school dropout, by and large, you're going to have challenging opportunities. To the degree that you have higher educational aspirations, you pursue lifelong learning, it provides more opportunities. And so the idea is, well, how can we make sure that everybody can take advantage of their full potential? They can all have, all of our children can have a purposeful life. 
And so I think investing in education and what MSEC is, how do we provide the support and the educational support? I think you know, you're an inspiration to us that we have to serve you and our children better. a group that we haven't mentioned, and those are our military chaplains. I've worked with chaplains throughout my career. The Coast Guard's very fortunate in that the Navy provides the chaplains who serve with us. And I've watched them continue to adjust and modify the programs in their ministry as they also have recognized along with us how important the welfare of the family, the situation of the children is to the readiness and the capabilities of our services. And they will come in at the drop of a hat, something happens, there's a crisis, maybe it's a personal family crisis. In our business, a lot of times we deal with death because we just get the call too late. We go out on a search and rescue case and there's no way that we could bring back a survivor. And that's very hard for our young Coasties to accept that. And the ministry by our chaplains helps them get stability, they run family programs, they run parenting programs, marital classes, so they really do contribute to what we're all about, which is looking after the welfare of our families and our children in particular. So thanks to all our chaplains who serve. Well done.